Hello, I'm Shannon Tiezi from The Diplomat, and I'm here today at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, where I'm happy to be joining Dr. Vikram Nehru, a senior associate here at the Carnegie Endowment. Dr. Nehru is going to be talking with us about the recent coup in Thailand and its regional implications. Thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here, Shannon. The military has taken control in Thailand um, after the Constitutional Court removed the Prime Minister from power. But this isn't exactly an unprecedented event for Thailand. That There have been over a dozen coups in the last 80 years. Um, how is this one similar to the previous ones and how is it unique? What makes this coup unusual is actually the circumstances in which it occurred. Mm. And there are really three defining circumstances. The first defining circumstance is, as you noted, there have been many coups in the past. But in the past, these coups were the reflection of political contests within the established elite in, ar in and around Bangkok. This time, however, it was different. The country faced a political impasse. On the one side, you had the Poi Thai party of Yinglak Shinawat. And on the other side, you had the established elite, which was a, mix a network of royalists and uh, military, as well as uh, uh, the business uh, elite. And neither side was willing to back down. Uh, and as a result, uh, the military had to step in. So this, this was unusual because there seemed to be no end in sight to the impasse. There seemed to be no obvious solution. Mm -hmm. The second defining circumstance this time around was the fact that the monarch, His Royal Highness, the King of Thailand, uh, is ailing. He is 86 years old. And he had been in hospital and clearly was either unable or unwilling uh, to intervene in the dispute. I do remember that reverence for the monarchy is the glue that holds the country together. But this time round, the monarchy had not intervened, which was unusual compared to previous uh, situations. And the third defining circumstance this time round was that for the first time, a political crisis was actually having an impact on the economy, mm -hmm. which made resolution of the impasse very important. You know, it's very interesting, in 2008, um, when the yellow shirt demonstrators of the time had occupied the airport, and there was a lot of unrest in Thailand, the economy didn't miss a beat. Mm. This time around, it's been such a protracted struggle that in the first quarter of this year, you had actually a decline in GDP. And the second quarter results have just come out and show more or less stagnation, a 1% increase, but that's more or less stagnation in the economy. Mm -hmm. So that, I think, worried a lot of people and made this a very unusual uh, situation for Thailand. So as you mentioned, this coup is really pitting the elite established forces around Bangkok against the more up-and-coming um, rural regions in the north and the northeast. Can you talk us through how these issues have been building over the past three years? Well, you're quite right in pointing to the fact that the North and the Northeast have been a key part of uh, the current crisis. The reality is that Thailand's very rapid growth over the last several decades has primarily been uh, focused on the locational advantages of Bangkok. Mm -hmm. And the rural areas, including the North and the Northeast, have languished. And as a result, income inequality has grown. And there's been a lot of migration from the north and the northeast to Bangkok. And these migrants have now been sending back their remittances to their families back home in rural areas, which has led to an increase in consumption. That increase in consumption has meant access to the internet, access to television, better education. And together with these improvements in their standards of living, have been rising aspirations, a desire to have their voice heard in the national debate, as well as a desire to increase public spending in their regions on things like health, education, and infrastructure. And consequently, uh, they have become an increasingly frustrated voice, if you wish, a voice uh, that did not uh, uh, get much uh, uh, room uh, in, in or hearing in Bangkok. And then came taxing. 
1998, he created at that time the Thai Rak Thai Party and tapped into this public discontent in the north and the northeast. And this happens to be the most populous region in Thailand, the most vote-rich region. Mm -hmm. And it became the base for his resurgence, for his surge in the polls. And finally, he won the election in 2001 and immediately began to implement programs such as health delivery to the poor for very, very modest prices. Literally, you could see a doctor for $1, mm. the price of $1. He provided uh, a very uh, low interest rate loans through village development funds, uh, provided um, incentives for farmers, both in terms of prices for their crops as well as lower prices for their inputs. And all of these made a big difference. In fact, they cemented his popularity in the north and the northeast. Indeed, you know, some people have said that Taksin offered a way for the poor in, in Thailand not just to get by, but to get ahead. Mm. Um, and uh, the, that, the, the Thai Rak Thai Party and its subsequent incarnations, the People's Power Party and now the Poet Thai Party, have continued to enjoy the support of the poor in the north and the northeast. Mm. And you mentioned before that the glue holding together Bangkok the north, the northeast, all of Thailand has been the monarchy. Uh, now the current king is ailing, as you mentioned, he hasn't really taken any serious role in this coup. Are we seeing an erosion of the influence of the monarchy in Thailand? Well, actually the monarchy continues to be held in, in, in great uh, reverence. Mm -hmm. What you what, I mean, the unusual situation here is not an erosion of the monarchy as such. Um, it is a dissatisfaction amongst large segments of the population outside Bangkok at the concentration of power mm. uh, in Bangkok uh, by the established elite and a lack of voice that the provinces of the North and Northeast have. Um, at the same time, there's also been an erosion of democracy not on the part of red shirt supporters, but on the part of the established elite, the Democrat Party, and their yellow shirt supporters, uh, because they have simply not accepted the outcome of the elections and have not accepted the results which, uh, which arose as a result of the change in the Constitution first in 1997 and then an amendment to the Constitution in 2007. Uh, so in all of this, uh, the monarchy was not a key factor. These were political forces uh, at play. But as you pointed out quite rightly, the fact that the king himself has been ailing has been a very key uh, um, factor in the current situation. And also to some extent, some members of the royal family have been seen to become partisan in the political struggle that has been taking place. And this may have eroded a little bit the, impartial, the reputation for impartiality uh, of, of, of the monarchy. So in that sense, the monarchy has played somewhat of a role, but not a key role in the current uh, situation. And you also mentioned the economic troubles that this is bringing to Thailand. How is this impacting the other regional countries in Southeast Asia? Well, it's very interesting. Not much. Uh, there hasn't. There isn't much trade uh, uh, that takes place uh, uh, between uh, these countries, between the other Southeast Asian countries and Thailand. Uh, obviously, there is some trade, but it hasn't had much of an impact. Mm. Um, and the most important point is that now that there's been a coup, the uh, the National Council for Peace and Order, which is what the military junta calls itself has placed economic stability at the very core, the highest priority of their agenda. So they, for example, have paid $2.8 billion of uh, money owed to farmers uh, under the previous government's uh, rice pledging scheme. Mm -hmm. uh, they have uh, uh, created a council, an advisory council, which includes a member who is responsible for economic affairs. Uh, they have decided to make it a priority uh, to restore confidence of foreign investors in the country. And so they're doing a lot of things to try and restore some semblance of uh, normalcy in the economy. They, for example, allowed shops now to stay open uh, fairly late. Uh, so they've given some exceptions uh, with regard to the curfew. And uh, they have returned the tourist areas to, uh, to normalcy as well. Mm 
So they've clearly made uh, economic stability a priority. And this, as far as the region is concerned, is actually good news uh, because it will have a positive impact uh, uh, on the economies of the region. Mm. So you mentioned before that this seems like a real impasse. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any end in sight in terms of compromise between the red shirts and the yellow shirts. Is there a way forward to end the uh, military control and return to democracy in Thailand? So far, the National Council of Peace and Order, the military leaders uh, who engineered the coup, have not said anything about how they propose to resolve the political challenge. Um, they have said that they are putting together this advisory council and be looking at uh, uh, um, changes that may be needed to the Constitution. Mm -hmm. And we'll have to wait and see uh, how that evolves. Um, I think if there are any uh, litmus tests that one can provide to what emerges, it will be whether the new Constitution gives increased voice and accountability and authority to the regions, especially the North and the Northeast. To what extent, for example, will the new Constitution allow some sort of a federal structure to the Thai polity? I think that would be one very important uh, element. The second important element, I think, would be um, whether, the, uh, whether there will be special provisions provided, say, for an upper house uh, that would give the established elite some comfort that their voice uh, will continue to be important in the new political structure and that they will continue to have a veto just in case there are forces in train uh, just as they have had in the past, which might lead to economic instability. Mm -hmm. um, and third, I think it's going to be very important uh, for long-term political stability in the country, for there to be political inst institutions, such as the Constitutional Court and the Anti-Corruption Commission, that are above the fray, somehow institutions that are inoculated against political capture by the government in power. Unfortunately, in the past, under Taksin, uh, they were captured by the Taksin forces. And then uh, they've now been captured, one would argue, by the monarchists uh, in, 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 in the, the monarchist network. And so this has led to uh, um, the erosion as centers of real authority. So if the new constitution can somehow ensure that these institutions can withstand political capture, then that would be a very important long-term contribution to the political stability of Thailand. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Nafer. Thank you very much indeed, Shannon. And thank you for joining us. Once again, I'm Shannon Tiezi from The Diplomat.